by nature to be the birthplace of ships. Around Britain, ships, big and small, are built of service in the four corners of the earth. And yet of these thousands of ships which leave British shipyards, no two, not even sister ships, are alike. Each has as distinct a personality as a human being. But if you come into a typical British shipyard, when they're laying the keel of a new ship, you will look in vain for this personality in the din and clatter of the yard. Your first impression will be to wonder how dead steel can ever go to sea, and how the number of a job can ever become the name of a living ship. There is little in the confused tangle of steel that can be recognized as part of a ship at all. This giant casting, for instance, hardly looks as if it will one day become merged in the graceful stern of a ship, giving the steering and propelling gear invisible strength. You may find it hard to imagine, too, that this great steel backbone now taking shape will soon be holding back the pressure of thousands of tons of sea water. But in the minds of the men who are building her, ship number 242 has already begun to take shape. Every plate and girder that comes into the yard has its own place not only in some part of that ship, but in the minds of the men who build her. From the crane driver, who has worked up for 20 years, to David, a new boy with his lump of chalk waiting to make his mark in the world. David's father works with red hot steel. His job is to hammer and twist ribs for the side of the ship. This is no haphazard work, for every rib is forged to an exact pattern marked out on the floor, and each is different. One of David's jobs is to keep his father supplied with tea. Cranes carry the finished ribs away to great machines which chew holes in half-inch steel as if it were cardboard. And if the hole is only the slightest bit out, you can throw the rib away. patience and hard work, the ship begins to rise in the stops. As the last ribs are fitted into position, we can see the outlines of a ship. And somewhere in this dead forest of steel girders is the spirit of a ship too. Now the ribs must be coated with steel. 
For this, thousands of steel plates are continuously coming into the yard. Each plate is tested by Lloyds before it leaves the steelworks, and every one carefully examined again when it reaches the yard. To us, perhaps, one plate seems the same as another. But the men know exactly where each plate belongs, including this one. First, they mark it for punching. In this case, it is punched by a special multiple punching machine. After it has been well and truly punched, the plate is next cut to its own particular shape on a shearing machine. Thus, it will fit snugly alongside the thousands of others which form the sides of the ship. David has other things to do besides expressing himself in chalk. He is learning his trade, at first helping to keep the yard tidy, picking up scrap as it falls from the machine. David has a great friend called Jock. Jock intends to be an electric welder like his brother. And in a year, he and David will be apprenticed to their trades. For five years, they will do nothing but learn. The skill and craft of shipbuilding is a tradition which carries on beyond the span of any man's life. It cannot be learnt in a book. It must be handed on from one to another from father to son, from brother to brother. In this yard are whole families who have grown up within it, families whose children will be building good ships when today is history. When night falls, not all the men go home. Some of the home guards stay to watch over the ships they have built. Dominating all the other sounds in the shipyard is the clatter and clanging of the rivets. Their work, above all others, makes steel go to sea. The riveters join the thousands of individual parts together and make them one. Half a million rivets will go into this ship, and one faulty rivet, only one, may cause a ship to spring a leak.
five years to train a man to hit a rivet soundly with a hammer. The boys who one day will be riveters learn their jobs within sight of their fathers and brothers. A new generation of shipbuilders is always in training. As the steel sides are hammered together, fresh armies of workers seal up her steel plates so that not even a drop of water may creep in between. Painters, too, climb all over her sides, and soon each steel plate merges into the next under a uniform of glistening paint. Time, runways are greased with tallow, so that at the launching, number 242 will slip easily into the water. Suddenly, behind the tangle of the shipyard, there is a ship. And now a new army takes possession. Carpenters, plumbers, electricians, and a dozen others. And each man gives something of himself to the character of the ship. of patient work are coming to an end. The men of the shipyard have worked their miracle in steel. Steel is ready to go to sea. Job number 242 will float on her first tide in a few hours. Little remains to be done. One by one, the props which have supported the ship on land have been knocked away. Stout ropes are prepared to replace these props and hold the ship in position. As the props go, the whole weight of this great ship will depend only on this bundle of ropes. And now, it is nearly full tide. As the time draws near, the men in the yard, and their wives and children, and people from miles around, gather to see how number 242 takes the water. For a little while, the noises of the yard are stilled. Another ship has been brought to life in British shipyards. She is an individual with a character of her own, but she is also one of the great and ever-growing family, the family of British built ships. Like the rest of her kindred, she will serve her owners well and do her job wherever she sails. 
And after her, in a ceaseless flow, come ships and yet more ships for the British Merchant Navy. Back in the yards, another keel is being laid.